Sorry about that. Go for it. Okay. Very good. Um, my background is I went to the University of Miami on a football scholarship. I, I actually played for the Hurricanes. I was their team captain my senior year. Um, I got my bachelor's degree there. I stayed on as a graduate assistant coach, got a master's degree in roofing. And then I went into business with my father, who was a roofing contractor up in Orlando. Um, I've been in the roofing business since 1978. I came down to South Florida in, in 1987, started my own company, and I've been down here ever since. I've worked on all of our trade associations and the national and the state trade associations. Um, I'm chairman of the board of Kaiser University and Everglades University, and I'm really proud of some construction degrees that I've helped bring there. Um, but my day job is I'm Best Roofing's president and CEO. I'm considered a forensic roof specialist. What that means is I've been around long enough to have seen most roof systems that uh, installed, how they age, how they eventually sometimes get replaced. Believe it or not, I've got a couple of roofs that are 40 years old out there that we put down that uh, I love to tell those stories. Um, I'm happily married. I got a bunch of kids and a bunch of animals. I live out in, in West Broward and um, um, that's it about me. Okay, so here's the question. What can I do to get ready for a hurricane? Um, it's all about preparation. Um, here's, a, here's a path of every major hurricane that has come off the coast of Africa uh, up towards us. And you see that red dot right in the middle there. That's that's South Florida. And you can see it, it you know, it, it's not, a, it, we're right in the bullseye. I mean, we are there. It's not an if, it's a when. And it, there's an awful lot of storms that just miss us all the time. But you know what? It's going to happen. And, and we all need to be prepared for that. Um, this is just a little bit of a graph that talks about the, 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 um, the different categories and what that wind speed is. I, and when I was putting this together, you know, we kind of talk about category five, but there actually is a category six and a category seven storm out there. Thank God we haven't had any of those, but, um, you know, that is on the radar. Um, here's some pictures, I think, that help just give you a little bit of a visual idea as to what's a category, what's a, what does the category mean and what kind of damage can we expect to our homes? A category one storm, is, the winds are going to be somewhere between 74 and 95 miles an hour. And you can see by this illustration, it's going to damage the landscape pretty bad. You're going to have some water rising and stuff. But most everything that's built here in our South Florida world is, is built to very easily withstand a category one storm. When you get into a category two storm, now that's when the winds get up to 96 to 110 miles an hour. You're going to have some really significant storm surge, especially if it's at high tide when the when the Maybe when the storm hits. Now. Um, is that a question? What? Um, you're going to have a lot of bad landscape uh, damage, <clears throat> um, but Category Two storms again, everything by code is built to withstand. Category two storms. Okay, now we get into a category three storm. This is when things really start getting serious. And when so, when we have a category three storm coming our way, you better really be battening down the hatches. Now, here's what I can tell you a story. Back in um, 2005, when Hurricane Wilma came through the backside of Broward County, here here it, it had sat out in the, uh, it, it, it was late in the year too, it had sat out in the Gulf uh, for like a couple of days, and then it kind of crept its way over by Naples. And what what do we all think when when it comes down to when a when a when a storm goes over land? What happens to it? It always slows down, right? Well, not this time. When that storm came across Naples, it got into the Everglades, and that Everglades water was really really hot. And that category one storm turned into a category three storm as it came across my house in West Broward and took the roof off of my house, took down all my landscaping. So that's what a category three storm looks like. I've lived through one and um, and, uh, and it's crazy. Category four storm, um, this is when you're going to start seeing major structural damage. I was actually in the middle of a category four storm one time. I was down in um, St. Thomas doing doing some work and um, a storm blew up and we couldn't get off the islands. And I was in a, I was in a Ramada Inn at the time and um, we were hunkering down and uh, and I mean, it, it was starting to get serious. And 
we, we put put our mattresses up against the sliding glass doors to ho hold the wind. And all of a sudden, it, it just was more than we could hold. And we ran into the bathroom and shut the bathroom door and just uh, just hoped that uh, that storm would go. And, and about two two hours later, it, 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 it slowed down. We opened up that door. And I'm telling you what, my hotel room was shredded. So I, I've lived through these things. And they are real. In a Category 4 storm, you really need to be in a safe environment because you can see by that picture what, what it can do. Um, category 5, hey, all bets are off. I mean, Category 5, that's what Andrew was back in 1993. You're going to see just terrible structural damage, big seas, big wind, big big water, um, just a lot of problems. So that that's kind of what you can expect by the different categories, and you really want to be prepared. And and here's the other thing that that I can tell you: it can go from a category one to a category three like that. I mean, just never underestimate a storm, and always be prepared. Um, the this is gives you a little bit of an idea as to when is prime time. Uh, the middle of September is really like prime time when when the storms are the worst. So there's there's a buildup. It, you know, you start seeing some storms in June, July. They start creeping up a little bit. August, okay, starting to be a little bit more on the news. Then September is when it really happens, and then it kind of fades away in the end. But you know, um, like I said, October. Uh, I think it was October 23rd was when a Andrew hit, and Andrew was the first named storm. And it, so you just never know. A, a hurricane season is so absolutely unpredictable they're saying 13 storms this year i don't know where they i don't know where they i think some guys go back and back in the room throw some dice and say okay 13 storms sounds good for us i don't know i don't think there's anything scientific about it but it's just um it is what it is so since 2000 there's been over 100 billion dollars in damage from hurricanes i mean hurricanes are, are a major factor as to what's happening with our insurance issues here in the state and and Every one of us are dealing with insurance issues. Um, Wilma in 2005, that was a category three storm, um, $20 billion worth of damage, a lot of roofs. You can see those blue tarps. Irma in 2017, that was a category four, $50 billion in damages. Uh, that got up to 142 miles an hour. You can see, look at just the devastation of those uh, uh, buildings. Um, Hurricane Ian, um, category four, 155, one, uh, uh, $113 billion worth of damage over on the West Coast. Just crazy. And that's and that's what's happening to our insurance rates and why so many carriers are just pulling out of the state of Florida. And those who are staying are saying, look, if I'm going to endure this risk, I'm going to get I'm going to get a you know a big premium for it. So um hurricanes are a big driver of what's behind um our problems with uh hurricanes. Um this, these are a couple of pictures. I I, I got a, took a helicopter ride over after Ian just to, to, just to check it out and see how bad it was. That's the bridge that goes over to uh, Sanibel Island. It got, it got washed out. Ian was such a, what they call a wet storm. This is when you have such a storm surge that comes up. There was like a, a 10 foot storm surge that came up and wiped so many houses just right off the beach there. A um, couple other pictures from from Ian. I mean, that that is just total, just devastation. Um, Andrew, uh, 1992, category 569 miles an hour. Look at the look at the devastation that that did to all of those buildings. So these big hurricanes, they don't come every year, but when they do come, boy, you really have to be prepared. And you you don't want to be in in a, a in an environment that's not prepared to handle a category five storm. Um, that's another one of uh, Ian just this last time. So what do you do? Well, when it comes to your roof, and, and I mean, it, when you get past a category three storm, pretty much all bets are off. You're going to start seeing all kinds of structural damage on your buildings and stuff. But what you can do to your roof and, and to be able to withstand all the way up through a category three, it's all about attachment. And what we do on the roof and this, this illustration kind of shows the most vulnerable part of any building is on the corners. That's where the greatest wind uplift is. 
Um, and we put three times as much attachment in the corners, in those red areas. Around the perimeter of the building, uh, we put twice as much attachment on the perimeter because um, roofs blow off from the edge in. They don't blow off from the center out. So once the edge is compromised and it starts lifting up, it's kind of like peeling a banana. It just comes off like really easy. So we really spend as much, uh, we spend a lot of extra time doing our perimeters. Um, you can see this is a building that, you know, again, it's it started right on the edge and, it, and that started peeling it back. Um, this is a case study back from Hurricane Wilma. It was called Sea Lakes Ranch uh, Plaza, category three storm when it hit my house out in West Broward, um, probably by the time that it hit uh, Sea Ranch Lakes, which is right along the coast, um, it might've been a category two storm. And this is what it looked like right after the storm. You can see how the wind lifted up the roof, those those kind of tan areas, that's actually the decking. The um, the gray areas was the roof. So it, it ripped the uh, the entire roof right off of the decking um, and through, through debris all over the place. And, and this is what happens during a storm. There's all kinds of flying debris. Look at all this tile that came off that mansard right there. I mean, all of those tiles flying around like Frisbees, um, just doing all kind of damage to windows and roofs and just anything else that it might hit. Um, and what, what ends up happening after a storm and what you want to kind of pay attention to is you want to get your building temped in as fast as you possibly can to try to mitigate the damages that are taking place. So in this particular case, we had a relationship with a shopping center owner and they called us and we went, went out there and we just put a temporary roof on the areas that had been compromised, tried to patch up everything while Everybody's trying to figure out, okay, what are we going to do? Are we going to re-roof the whole thing? Or who's going to pay for it? Is it going to be the insurance? What's my deductible? Where are we going to, you know, what about my tenants? Or can they operate? There's just so many questions that go into what do we do after a hurricane hits. Um, that's the crew down there working on the job. And then I call mission accomplished. We ended up putting a new roof on the building. Um, these are just some pictures that give you a little bit of an idea of what damage from hurricanes looks like. Um, tile roofs, um, today, most tile roofs are installed with a, a foam adhesive, which gives them a much higher wind uplift rating. This is an old tile roof that was set in, set in concrete, and, the, and the, uh, the tile will peel off much easier with concrete than it will low-rise foam. If you have a shingle roof, shingles, um, are not very high rated uh, when it comes to wind uplift on your building. As a matter of fact, the code says you shouldn't put shingles on a building more than three stories high. Um, so shingles, if you have a shingle roof, you can expect to probably have some problems because the wind gets underneath them and, and just kind of blows them up. Here's another shingle roof that yeah, they don't do really great in uh, in hurricanes, especially. Well, you can't you can't put them on anything over three stories. Metal roofs usually do very well. This is a this is one that that had a little bit of a problem. I guarantee it was a pretty heavy storm. Metal roofs really do good in uh, in hurricanes. Again, unless you have like a Category Four or a Category Five like this one. Uh, here's a building. Uh, this was like an armory that uh, lost all of its roof. And again, they always blow from the edge in. So what we try to do is we want to put um, extra attachment at the edges there. You can see when we put our eave metal down, we put a hurricane clip right behind that of a heavier gauge metal. And again, it just holds that metal on there. Hopefully, um, strong, you know, it keeps your roof from peeling off. But every roof comes off from the edge in. So what do you do before a hurricane? You really need to have some sort of relationship with a roofing company. If you If you were to call me, like two days before a hurricane or right after a hurricane and, and think I would be able to help you? Probably not. And it's not because I wouldn't want to. It's just I have so many clients that I've worked with for such a long time that every contractor services the clients that they have a relationship with. Somebody, you know, and what's a relationship? I mean, if we're fixing your roof leaks, at least we know what your building is and we've got all of the information, what kind of deck it is, what kind of insulation you have, what kind of roofing system do you have, so that when we send our guys out, we already know what to send and we can and we can hopefully resolve the problem as fast as possible. So um, if you don't have a relationship with some sort of a roofing company, I really encourage you to get something going. So right, let's talk point. a little bit Let about what causes. 
Greg, that's yep. a great point. Let me interject. I got a few questions here, and there are a lot of insurance. Uh, there are a lot of insurance questions. So, you know, just like you need a relationship with your roofer, you need a relationship with your engineer, you need a relationship with your uh, insurance company. Um, I answered some of the insurance companies. Greg is not an insurance expert, um, but there are a lot of questions about silicone roofs. You mentioned the uplift being from the corners, and there's some pushback from insurance companies on some silicone roofs. And silicone roofs have a great place with certain applications for commercial, agricultural, so on and so forth. But it's not a new roof. So people are saying that they got a new roof. It's a 10-year warranty. But a silicone coating is not a new roof because you talk a lot about the tie-downs and the strapping. Isn't that what the insurance companies are looking for when they're talking about a new yeah. roof? Yeah, let me take it from here on that. Okay, so a silicone roof is a coating. What that is, is like putting SPF 300 on your skin. I mean, it's a very heavy, durable, great product, great product. But what it does is it just preserves and protects the roof that you have. The roof that you have is what's holding that, uh, holding down to your building. Too many people are representing silicone as a roof or as a new roof. It's not a new roof. What it is, is it's a resurfacing. It will extend the life of your existing roof, but it's not a new roof. And there's too many people that are getting scammed by people who are selling this as a new roof. So Rudy, you and I are on the same page there. Yep. So I would con I would tell everybody that if you got a 10 year warranty on your roof, the most important thing, check with your insurance company because the insurance company is going to get what they want. And if they tell you a new roof and you put a silicone roof product on two, three years ago, even though it has a 10 year warranty, that's not a new roof. So make sure you check with your legal counsel and your insurance broker uh, before you do anything like that. Now, now here's something that you can do. And we've been we've been helping some clients out with this. If you have a silicone roof and the insurance company says you need a new roof, you can hire an engineering firm to come out and do a wind uplift test on that roof. Because see, what the insurance company really wants to know is, will that roof stay on in a Category 3 storm? You know, um, is it properly attached? So if you get a wind uplift test on your roof, sometimes insurance companies will take that. Now, here's what I would encourage you to do. Clear that with your insurance company before you go out and do the test. Don't go out and do the test and say, hey, this says that my roof is attached. Make sure that they're that they're comfortable with that. And and usually that is, I've been able to help a handful of clients with that and they didn't have to replace their roofs. And it's so. the same with the spray foam. Spray foam is not considered a new roof. TPO roofs, um, is that, you know, do you get discounts for that? You'd have to ask an insurance company. So we answered a lot of questions right there. So thanks for taking the time, Greg. Okay. Very good. All right. So here's a cartoon that just gives you a little bit of an idea, a picture of what causes premature roof failure. And then here's the thing that I always, uh, you know, want to remind people. Um, fixing the roof and maintaining your roof is a fraction of what the consequences of having roof problems are. And, and a lot of times what will happen is you'll have a roof leak and you don't know it. Because sometimes they're just small little leaks that get into your drywall or get behind your walls or into your ceilings. And then it starts decomposing your decking and your and your uh, your drywall starts getting mold and stuff like that. And then, then before you know it, um, those little bitty drips turn into major, major problems. So um, this gives you this cartoon gives you a little idea what the consequences of having a roof leak are. Um, all right, I want to I want to talk about knowing where your roof is in its life cycle. Now, this is this graph that I'm showing you is about flat roofs. This is on flat commercial roofs is what I'm talking about. In the first 10 to 20 years of your roof's life cycle, you, you're going to be in that green section. Um, you should be spending your 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 time, your effort, your money on repairs and maintenance. Now, let me tell you the difference. I went to the dentist today, okay? Now, I didn't go to the dentist today because I had a cavity. I went to the dentist today because I really believe in tooth maintenance. And I get, I get my teeth cleaned every four months. And I haven't had, I, I can testify that I haven't had a cavity or, or a tooth problem in 25 years, okay? And I'm telling you, it works. And the same thing works on your roof. Um, 
you can't leave your roof out in the sun 24-7, 365 days of the year. And if you have mechanical equipment up there and people walking all around it and stuff, you know, there's going to be something that needs to be done. Now, um, maintenance is, is what we call fixing a roof leak before it's a roof leak. And repairs are when you fix a roof leak after you have a leak. And usually you're going to have some sort of consequential damages after that. So when we do a roof inspection, what we do is we give you an idea as to where your roof is in its life cycle and then how many years you have left on that roof. Now, here's what I can also tell you. If you do good maintenance, you can be like me and not have a cavity in 25 years, okay? You could, have a, you could not have a roof leak for a long time because good trained professional people know what to look for on a roof. But as your roof ages, and just like all of us, I mean, I'd like to think I was going to live forever, but I'm not. Um, but I get into that area we call the window of restorability, okay? This is a time when you can resurface or recover your roof. And this is where silicone comes in. Silicone is a good resurfacing of your roof. It's not a new roof, but what it does is it extends the life of your roof. Now, in today's insurance environment, you really need to make sure that the investment that you're putting into that silicone and that warranty is going to be recognized by your insurance company, um, like Rudy had said. So, But then eventually, every roof is going to get to that day of reckoning uh, where it needs to be replaced. And um, what happens is I've seen roofs that get really bad that when somebody walks on them, it just causes it to crack or to split. And like when all the asphalt just gets all the oil, ble you know, uh, baked out of it. So, you, you know, you really don't want to be replacing a roof when you're in that kind of situation. So um, that's and, and if you own a property or manage a property, you really need to know where that roof is in its life cycle and that you're preparing for that roof replacement. That roof replacement, that's a big deal. That's that's like one of the most significant things that you have to do um, right, right up there with concrete restoration these days. So if you don't know where your roof is in its life cycle, here's what you need to do. You need to have somebody do a roof inspection for you. And um, this is what a roof inspection from Best Roofing looks like. It's gonna give you an overview of the roof. Um, we're gonna give you an idea of the square footage when we think the roof was installed, and then you're gonna get a grade on that roof. And in this roof, we gave it a grade of a C. So, you know, that, that means there's probably about nine years left of life on there. And then we're gonna identify all of the issues on the roof. We're gonna do a core cut just to understand how much insulation you have on your roof. Um, then we're gonna identify the deficiencies. And what we do is we, we classify deficiencies in two categories. We say, we got emergency deficiencies here. These are things that you must do. You got water coming in your building right now. You don't even know about it. And then we have over here what we call remedial uh, deficiencies. These are, these are going to be a problem. There might not be a real problem right now, but they're going to be a problem. We identify how many of those deficiencies you have. We give you a unit price on them, and we give you an idea of what it's going to cost to fix those deficiencies. After we go through all the deficiencies, we're going to give you kind of recap. We're going to grade three things on your roof. There's three components that are really critical. The field of your roof, the membrane, okay? The flashings, everywhere that a roof changes direction, we're going to want to make sure that, you know, we're going to give those a grade. And then the sheet metal, all of your sheet metal trim. This is where uh, buildings, that, especially if you're on the coast, if you're in a coastal environment and you have galvanized metal, we see so much galvanized metal rusting out from the salt exposure and, and causing premature roof failure. So right here, we're saying that this roof grades out as a C. There's five to seven years worth of useful life left on that. But if you're doing good roof maintenance, we might be able to extend that and, and not not that's not a might that's a that's a we definitely can and then we're going to give you some recommendations and then here's the other thing that we're going to do we're going to give you a, a report that says all right here's all my emergency repairs here's my remedial and then you know what if i had to replace my roof and here's what i want you to think about i want you to think of your roof as a depreciating asset that roof is only getting worse every day so in this in this slide. I think I can't read that, but it's like 300. What is that, Jan? Okay. Your roof asset is worth $355,000. Okay. You got to protect that roof asset. It's like changing the oil in your car, you know? 
Um, it kind of puts that roof maintenance into perspective. Let me protect that asset. Let me take that five to seven years and turn that into a, a nine to, to 11 years. And you can do that with just good roof maintenance. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about codes, permits, and insurance, because those are really big drivers that we have today. Greg, um, before you get into that, quick question. What is roof maintenance? You say that you got to maintain your roof. Give us some examples of what proper uh, required maintenance is. Okay. So here's what we do when we, when we uh, do a roof maintenance. Um, we call them umbrella agreements. Uh, we go up on the roof, and the first thing we do is we make sure that everything is cleaned off the roof and, and that there's not any sort of debris, any leaves, any materials left by any trade contractors, anything like that is up there. Um, then we inspect every flashing condition. And um, my my other classes, I talk a lot about roof maintenance, so I, I, and I have pictures that I can show you. But what we do is we check every flashing condition. What's a flashing condition? That's anywhere that the roof changes direction. It could be a skylight. It could be a curb. It could be an exhaust fan. It could be a plumbing stack. It could be at an AC unit. Anywhere, anything's coming up through the roof. Now, here's what I can tell you. 90% of all roof leaks happen at a flashing condition. So we, we inspect all the flashing conditions. We make sure that they're, that they're good. We look for any ponding water um, and just anything that could be a problem, we're gonna go ahead and take care of it. Um, just like a good dental hygienist is gonna take care of your teeth. So that's what roof maintenance there is. Um, codes today, our codes here in this Florida market are some of the strictest codes there are in the country. And you know what? That's really good. And, and, it, and I remember in 1993 after Hurricane Andrew, that's when South Florida uh, really started getting serious and, and we had the, um, we started doing testing on roofs and just determining what roofs worked and what roofs don't. And every roof that's installed today has to have had a test. And, and there are so many, there, there are, there's as many different flavors of roofs as there are pizzas, okay? So let me tell you what, what I mean by that. It's like you got different kinds of decks. There's six different decks that we work with. Um, wood decks, concrete decks, tectum decks, lightweight concrete decks, gypsum decks, um, uh, metal decks. You got six different decks. Then you got insulation. There's about six different kinds of insulation. Then you've got different kinds of membranes, single plies, um, TPOs, PVCs, KEEs, modified bitumen, APP, SPS, all these different kinds. So there are so many different ways to weave one of these pizzas together. And, and, and that's in every one of those roofs have to be tested, specifically tested for how much pressure is going to take to blow that roof off. So that's what our code system does. You know, I, I'm not going to tell you I'm a big fan of uh, building inspectors. I hope there's no building inspectors watching this. Um, some of them can be really difficult at times, but I got to tell you, our code system, the intention of what our building departments uh, have done here in the state of Florida is really great. And, and, it, and it's protecting every homeowner, every building owner, every condominium association from getting a, a system that was properly designed and installed like it should be, okay? So insurance, I don't know what I can say about that. There's some insurance people who are a lot smarter than I am on this, on this. Uh, but insurance is getting crazy and it's because there's just been so many claims. And, the, and, and what's happened is so many people have moved or our companies have moved out of the state and there's so little competition. And, um, you know, we're all fighting insurance battles. I, 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 I got the insurance, you know, I got a, 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 a pink slip from my insurance company this year telling me they weren't going to renew my policy. So, and, you know, so I, I'm, I'm dealing it with, with it just like everybody else. Um, roof warranties, want to talk just a little bit about those. They were written by lawyers and they were written by lawyers and they usually are not for the consumer, they're they are for the roofing manufacturer, they're for the roofing contractor. Um, there's a lot of exclusions in warranties. Roof warranties um, are really great if you have a catastrophic uh, material failure, they'll cover you. But if you have a leak or something like that, they're always gonna say, 
Um, that's a maintenance item. So just be aware of that. Um, too many people confuse their roof warranty with their insurance policy. Every year when we have a big hurricane, I'll get a couple of calls from some people that just really don't understand. They'll say, hey, my roof blew off. It's under warranty. When are you going to be out here to fix it? And I got to remind them, no, no. Roof warranties are different than that. You need to read your warranty. Uh, that's your insurance policy. So, um, Can I interject what's something covered? on that, Greg? Yes, uh, yeah. I just wanted to interject that uh, the next speaker is uh, Ricardo from RMS, and he is all about uh, understanding those warranties. So I hope you stay on for the second part of this, uh, everyone that's listening. Thank you. And not every roof warranty is the same. I mean, um, you know, you, you really have to pay attention to the fine print. Um, just like, just like roofing products, you have a good, better, best. That's kind of what you have with roof warranties. Um, you know, you got some that are material only, and then you got some labor and material, and then you got what they call an NDL, which is a no dollar limit warranty. So what's covered and what's not under on roof warranties. Most of the time, if you have a leak, that's going to be a maintenance item. They're going to kick that back to you and say, you should have been maintaining your roof. But if you do have a catastrophic bad batch of material or it wasn't installed right, the warranty will cover you for that. Um, these are what This is what the, the roof warranties usually look like. Big print up at the top, but the little print always taketh away down at the bottom in, in the area called exclusions from coverage. So make sure that you've read your roof warranty. Um, Senate Bill 4D, that uh, was just uh, recently passed. Let's talk about that just a little bit. Um, it was all stimulated by the 13-story collapse of the Surfside building. I mean, um, it's just catastrophic what happened there, and it was so, so preventable if people were just paying attention to uh, the conditions and the, uh, the the maintenance requirements that in the facility, and, and the government now has stepped in and, um, and has legislated um, that there must be some things done, and I'm going to talk about that right now. You can see there that how it, that building just totally collapsed in as a structural failure, and um, it had to do with the corrosion of the rebar inside the uh, concrete. You got to realize concrete absorbs water. If you don't have good paint, good waterproofing over your concrete, that salt air and salt water can get inside your concrete and it, it'll cause something that we call spalling. And this is what spalling looks like. It's where the, it's where the rebar, that, that steel in there rusts and, and concrete unfortunately has zero flexibility. And as that rusts, what it does is it causes the concrete to come off and exposes that rebar and then it rusts out. And the rebar is what gives your building really all, you know, the rebar in conjunction with the concrete give you your structural capability. So this is how you fix it. This is how you fix it. But in the Surfside case, they had let it go so long that um, the rebar had rusted through and then it just was a catastrophic catastrophe. So milestone inspections that you have to do uh, according to this bill is you gotta have a licensed engineer or architect do your inspections. This applies to all buildings, three-story or more. Um, you, if you have a three-story or more building, this applies to you. Your first inspection has to be done um, by December 31st of the 30th year of your building. So it used to be a 40-year inspection. No, no, no. It's a 30-year inspection now. If you are three miles from the coast, um, it's 25 years because they're, they're saying that that salt environment really is, uh, is special. And then every 10 years after that, you have to do an inspection. Now, um, here's what the inspections look like. First, you're gonna have what's called a visual inspection. And your inspector is gonna look at it and say, does that pass the smell test? Do I see any problems? Um, if they have the slightest thought that there could be a problem, they're going to ask for some what they call a phase two, which is destructive testing. They're going to go like underneath it. Like, let me give you a for instance. The roof is one of those inspections. If if there's been a lot of roof leaks on this building, and if there's been, you know, areas that you can see patched and stuff, they're probably going to want to do some testing. They're going to want to do a core cut. They might want to do a moisture survey. They might want to do a wind uplift test. 
but they're going to do want to do some testing on that. Um, here's the life safety components that that have to be inspected. Definitely the roof, all your load bearing walls, um, your your floors, your foundations, your fireproofing, um, your plumbing, your electrical system. Um, Waterproofing, windows. I left elevators off. Jan, let's put elevators in. Okay. okay. So any repair that's above ten thousand dollars, they're going to want. They're going to want. So um, all the life safety components of your building are going to need to be inspected. Um, then you're going to have to set up reserve funds um, to accommodate those. So what you're going to have is a schedule and you probably, you know, all of you who live in communities are probably being faced with this right now. You're going to have a schedule that says, all right, my roof has nine years worth of life left on it. Okay. I need to start reserving for that roof replacement. And the estimated cost of that roof replacement is, we'll call it $500,000. Okay. We got to make sure that we have a reserve for that so that, um, we're in a position to do that when the time comes, okay? Um, these reports are based on, you know, the visual and the destructive testing of the architect and the engineer. And then you're going to have to have somebody do that reserve study. And there are organizations and people who specialize in doing that for associations. Um, Senate Bill 2D, this is really for residential and single family homes. Um, the state requires insurance companies can no longer require you to replace your existing roof if the roof is less than 15 years old. And there was a lot of that going on. Somebody had a 10 year old roof and their the insurance companies coming in and they're, they're saying, you got to replace your roof. Mm -hmm. But it kind of backfired on them because here's what's happening now. All the insurance companies are saying, OK, if 15 years is the benchmark, if your roof is 15 years or greater, you have to replace that roof, whether it's leaking or not. So I think this I think this is going to shake out a little bit, but that's the way the legislation reads like right now. Um, so a little recap there. If you're three miles from the coast uh, and you're greater than than uh, three stories high, and, and, which is probably about where Interstate 95 runs, um, you you fall into that high risk group. Um, I think there's going to be a shortage of engineers and architects once this thing gets gets moving and. Um, I would encourage you, you, we got about two years left before this, this is supposed to definitely be done. Some cities and, and are, are having a little stricter uh, enforcement than what the states are. Um, and then, um, and just for the record, Best Roofing can do the roof inspections and we can, we're happy to provide that to the engineers and the architects. And we're doing that right now. Yeah. Um, a little Sorry, I want to touch roofing. on that real we, quick. There's a glitch yep. bill coming out, and the city of Broward and the city of Dade just issued that you don't have to be an engineer or architect. You actually have to be an SI, which is a structural, um, which is a structural inspector. And there's not a lot of people that have that class. We actually are one of the one firms that actually have one on on staff. So now the the, the normal PE and a normal architect that used to be able to do those milestones and those structural integrity reserves. Um, the glitch bill might actually change that, but these other municipalities, they even went deeper and they thinned out the pool even more. You have to be what you call an SI, a structural inspector, and uh, there's not a lot of in not not a lot of them out there. So it's going to make it even more and more difficult to get that uh, to get that done. Rudy, can you send me that information? Thank you very much. That's I, I, I missed that. Yep. That's uh, that's good for some and not good for others. So right. All right. Um, just a little bit about best roofing you can see there we've got probably the largest service department um, in in south florida um, this is what our trucks look like every one of them is properly stocked with materials when we get to a job we're, re we're ready for action we got all the tools and materials that you need okay uh, what to look for when you're uh visiting or you when you're getting ready to think about hiring a contractor um here's what i always tell people there's two kinds of contractors over here you've got what we call the broker he subcontracts everything, has no real permanent employees. Everybody just kind of is peace workers. Over here, you got companies that have full-time employees that get paid by the hour that are that are trained. Um, I call this the builder. I call this the broker. I guarantee you, you will get a better project with a builder. So just find, go visit their place of business and just find out how many employees do you have and are you really capable of doing my job? 
Um, make sure that they've done work like you're doing. There are so many different kinds of roofs, especially when it comes to high rise. Uh, and, and, and you need to make sure that they have experience doing your kind of roof. You don't want to be the guy, the first person to uh, have somebody cut their teeth on your style of roofing system or building. Make sure they have a dedicated service department. I would never let my roof replacement guys go out and fix a leak. They don't know how, but but the service guys, they 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 know how water gets into a building. They can track it down and they'll do a much better job. And we have you you won't have as many callbacks. Make sure you do your own reference checks. Um, make sure that that your contractor has their own equipment and like cranes and dumpsters and equipment that you know you use on the roof uh, be skeptical of a low price if i knew how competitive the roofing market was when i got into business with my dad i probably would have thought twice about it another career but if you have a project where your price is more than 10 percent different from your other prices there's probably some sort of scope of work difference so just make sure that if the prices or there's a big spread that you really have somebody help you understand what what am I actually getting for that or having having a uh, a specification by from somebody like Ricardo who writes specifications so that you know you're comparing apples to apples when it comes down to uh, doing your projects. Make sure that you have uh, your insurance certificates with you named as an additional insured. And make sure that the that the company has paid their insurance. There's a lot of insurance fraud going on there. And then here's the last thing. Look at the company and just say, are they going to really be able to honor that my warranty? If I have a problem and I call them up two years from now, do, you, do I think they'll come out and, and fix that? Can I trust them? Can I really trust them? So um, that's it. I, if you are a CAM, um, Diana, we just need to get your CAM license and your information, and we'll make sure that you get registered. You're going to get one credit hour for uh, for visiting with me. And I really thank everybody for showing up. And Peggy, um, as always, you you guys are the best, and I love to help anywhere I can. So thank you very much. Any other questions, Rudy? Hit your mic. <laughs> Sorry, the uh, mailman comes around uh, one o'clock and the, the dog is going crazy. Um, so best roof replacement methods. Is there a good, better, best for flat roofs? Is it TPO? Is it hot mop? Is it, um, you know, bit mod? What's the good, better, best? Or do, or do you okay, actually so, look at it that way? Yeah, yeah, we do. We do. Um, but you really have basically two kinds of roofing, commercial roofing today. On this side, you got modified bitumen, okay? And modified bitumen is an asphalt rubberized, most of the time polyester felt built in between it where you're getting multiple layers of modified bitumen, okay? Then on the other side, you've got what we call single plies. And the single ply could be, too many people think of TPO as single ply. TPO just happens to be one single ply chemical formulation. You've got KEE, -E, you've got PVC and a couple other alphabet soup uh, recipes there. So you basically got two kinds. Now, both of those technologies have a good, a better and a best. Um, and they'll, they'll have like a, a 15 year warranty, a 20 year warranty, a 30 year warranty. And it usually has to do with the thickness of the membrane and then just how much redundancy maybe you have in the seaming process or whatever. So um, and every roofing technology has a low, a middle, and a higher end. All Thank right. You. Yep. Anything else? Nope. We cleaned them all out. Okay. Uh, we answered your questions. If you guys have any further questions, please contact Diana. Uh, she'll make sure that you get those questions answered. Okay, Greg, thank you so right. much. And thank you for all the uh, kudos. And uh, I really appreciate you. And I hope everyone got something out of this. And with that, I'm going to introduce Ricardo Mancata, who is with RMS. He is the chief inspector. And Ricardo, take it away. Thank you, Peggy. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. And uh, thank you, everybody that is on the um, 
on this program. Uh, thank you, Greg. Greg is always very informative and entertaining. I love uh, to hear, hear him present or see him present. Um, we've worked in many projects in the past together. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about who we are and uh, what RMS does before we get into um, the subject matter. So I've been in this industry for over 35 years in the roofing and waterproofing industry in many capacities. Um, RMS, we are not contractors. We are consultants. We don't do any part of the labor. Uh, we only do the uh, consulting, as uh, uh, Greg was saying. We do assessments. We do inspections. We write specifications. We do quality assurance. We help you, the building owner, throughout the process, from the assessment to determine what is that your, your roof needs, help you with the um, bidding process so you can get competitive bids, which most bylaws require competitive uh, bids to um, be able to select a contractor. Uh, we help you with the contractor selection. And once you select the contractor, we work with the contractor through the permit process, uh, the pre-construction phase, and then the quality assurance. And last but not least, also with the closeout of the project. Very, very important to have all the documents that are pertinent to your project all in one place so that in case you need either for the billing department or for a warranty situation, you have all the documents in one place. So that's what we do. Um, today, we're going to talk about assembling your A team. And this is an HR um, class with uh, one credit HR for for the CAMs. I know that Peggy and her team has, have gathered all your uh, CAM license numbers, so no need to add that to the chat or anything. They, If you register, they have your information, and we will be sending out your certificate uh, in, a, in a few days. Um, Peggy, do you have the, the presentation, or do I have to share it from my screen? You have to share it. All right. Perfect. <laughs> All right, perfect. So um, I'm gonna be looking at a different uh, screen here. So I have the camera on one side, the screen on the other. So again, as I was telling you, this is assembling your A-team, human resources for hurricane readiness. This is not a technical presentation. This is more of putting the abilities and the proficiencies of a lot of people around you to help you get back to business in case of a storm. So, um, Okay, so again, this is for uh, uh, um, HR uh, credit. We'll report it to the DBPR. And at the end of the presentation, you'll be able to identify the key team member needed to respond to an emergency, understand the role of each team uh, candidate, understand the importance of a pre-storm planning, and create the right checklist to minimize surprises. You know, what happened here in uh, Fort Lauderdale last week, uh, where a lot of houses uh, and a lot of businesses had um, water damage that did not come from, well, some came from the roof, but uh, it wasn't a hurricane. It was just a pre-rainy season storm and look what it, all the things that happened. And um, most of the um, most of the damage requires either a water mitigation company or is gonna require a, uh, an adjuster. And for the insurance to pay out all those uh, losses. So it is important to be aware of all the things that can happen to your building and be able to put together a team that will help you navigate those murky waters after the, after the storm. The whole idea is, <clears throat> excuse me, the whole idea is to help you get back in business as quick as possible. Um, whether 
you are um, a property manager for an office building or you are a property manager or, a, or a association manager for a residential building, you want your elevators, your lights, your parking, your um, common areas to be functional as soon after the storm hits um, the area. So um, the last thing you want to do when your building and your operation have been compromised by the effect of a storm is, is to look for available vendors and try to negotiate fees and prices. If you wait until the storm happens to start looking for uh, a water restoration company or a an adjuster or look for your insurance policy, that is way too late. You're late in the game. And uh, unfortunately you will suffer the consequences because most of um, the different disciplines that we're gonna be talking about have pre-approved or pre-arranged engagements with their clients and they're gonna be going and attending to their clients first before taking any new uh, clients. So really important, that's why we wanna be ready, we wanna line up the, the team. So let's talk about the different kinds of, of hurricanes. And I'm gonna go through this um, fairly quick. So we got a category one. There've been a lot of category ones through this area. And sometimes people even make fun of them on social media saying, oh yeah, hurricane category one came through and all it did was knock down a plastic chair in the, in the patio. Well, they're uh, 74 to 95 miles an hour. They can really on a, on a if they have a uh, if, they, if the hurricane finds or the the wind finds a weak spot on the roof or in an AC unit or in um, in the in the um, tie down of an AC unit, it'll blow it out and and roll it around the roof or pick up the corner of the roof and peel it right off. So don't uh, be fooled by you know the categories. Once it gets to category category one, it's really strong. The 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 rain that we had last week, it came in through all parts of the buildings, and we were not even close to having category um, one hurricane. Uh, category two, which is you're talking ninety six to one hundred and ten miles an hour, they're extremely dangerous. Uh, will uh, the wind will cause extensive damage to your roofs, your trees. Um, the tr some trees down here in Florida that grow like the roots don't go deep but go sideways. Those are the first ones to get knocked down. So um, they block roads and uh, it makes uh, first responders access difficult to your property. So you have to be prepared for that. Category three, um, and you're talking now a major storm. It's 111 to 129 miles per hour and they have a devastating damage. Um, your roofs will will probably uh, be damaged. There's a lot of flying debris. There's a lot of um, trees that fall down, power lines, um, water, the water system. Uh, just look at what's happening with the, um, with the gas right now in Broward County where the pumps at the port got flooded. And even though they have the gas, they couldn't, get it to the gas stations. So there's lines, people are panicking, thinking there's a there's a gas shortage. There's no gas shortage. It's just the problem of access of the pipes to the uh, to the gas. So it really, it, it, these are just examples of the, the damage that a big storm can cause in a community. Um, in category five, uh, if you were here for Andrew, uh, you probably remember how it was. If you remember uh, Katrina in New Orleans, I mean the the amount of devastation and the the havoc that it that it brought to that area was immense, and it took years for those areas to recover. So, um, so you know, I I hope that we don't see a Category Five in our area um, anytime. Uh, so those are the different categories of hurricanes, and that's the kind of damage that they can cause. So given that, we have to be ready and we have to be with all the our team ready 
to respond and get back on our feet as quick as possible. So what are the components of a building that get damaged when a hurricane hits? So definitely your walls and your windows. You know, people don't think about the walls and the windows. People think that water only comes through the roofs. Well, I can tell you, being in this business, more water comes through the vertical side of the building than typically from the roofs. It's harder to uh, give preventive maintenance to the walls and the windows than it is to the roof. So when a storm hits and it comes with wind and the rain is falling sideways and it's getting pushed through all gaps and cracks, of the building, a lot more water comes um, to your building through the, the walls and the um, and the windows. And uh, not not even to talk about the finishes and the damage they, they cause to the facade and the, uh, the details on the exterior of your building. Um, the storm also causes a lot of damage in the surrounding of the building. Your landscape, um, you know, trees will be falling around. The building or it might fall on the building and uh, and break stuff, break windows or the your carport or your um, your car lobby. So those are things that happen during hurricanes. Of course, the roofs, your roofs, not only the the water damage, the roofs are made to, especially down here in South Florida, are made to stand most categories without blowing off. If they are, you know, probably built within the last 15, 20 years. However, there's a lot of debris that flies on the roofs that could cause damage to the roofs. And it doesn't matter uh, how well built the roof was if there's damage by a flying panel of a uh, AC unit just rolling around the, the roof, it's gonna cut um, or split the roof and water will come in in, in those areas, it'll move things around. It'll move the AC units. It might move some of the, the pipes that are on the roof and that could break the seals and water will go through the penetrations. Um, the communications, that's key to uh, getting back to business as quick as possible. Working on the communication and having a plan to have two or three layers of communication in case your phones are down um, or the, the, the voice to voice lines are down, uh, text, email, what if your, your Wi-Fi is down? So you have to be prepared to have ways to communicate to first responders and then to your vendors and your team once the storm has passed. Um, and of course, sorry, electricity. Electricity gets, electricity gets um, uh, affected. The power is down and then it just, a lot of things uh, trailer the, uh, the the lack of electricity, your computers, your Wi-Fi, your, your charging stations, everything. Um, unfortunately, right now, more and more things depend on electricity. And uh, so we have to be prepared on what would happen if we, if our building is completely out of power. And, and FPL tells us, that is gonna take three weeks to get it back on. So those are things that we need to think about. I know we don't like to think about them, but it's really, um, oops, sorry. Uh, it's really important to have those in mind when we're planning um, our team. Um, so what becomes urgent? Once, just imagine that your building gets hit. Uh, the first thing is safety. Uh, the the well-being of the occupants should be the number one priority after a major storm uh, if it has affected the integrity of your building. You have to be careful if there is flooding, if there is um, not only inside the building but around the building. Uh, last night in the news, I was uh, listening that uh, I was listening to the news and I heard that a couple of first responders trying to get help some people to come out of their house or to leave their house, uh, stepped on a live wire and uh, a couple of them got, got electrocuted. They didn't die, fortunately, but that's the risk of, um, of having, you know, uh, flooding or, or areas where you cannot walk. You have to think about safety first. Um, you have to triage the damage. You have to stop the bleeding. Uh, you have to have a real-time assessment of the building components that 
where affected to provide the space for deploying preparedness plans effectively. So you need to know which part of your building got affected and you cannot do this until after the, the storm has passed. So um, be ready to do that. So you know which team members to, to uh, call on to help you get back on your feet. You have to minimize the impact. And again, you just have to stop the bleeding. Um, any, you also need to know what that means in, for your building, because each building is going to be different, uh, so that you know which of your vendors, which are your team members, has to be deployed first. And just to give an example, um, there's a lot of tree damage and the roads are closed. There's no need to call on your roofing company or your roofing contractor or your or your consultant if your if they can access the the building so the first one is going to be the debris removal company to come and clean the roads and clean the access to to your uh, to your building so those are the things that you need to have very clear to, to be able to deploy your plan effectively and then, uh, last but not least, you have to start working on restoring your operations. You can't have to keep the momentum going uh, on your way to getting back to business as usual as quick as possible. So you're going to engage your team, and uh, you have to keep that momentum going. And we're going to talk about how to do that, too. Um, so what's the lineup for hurricane season? What you see on the screen is... The, the minimal lineup that you want to have on your corner before hurricane season. So you want to you want to talk to your insurance agent and you want to know your coverage limitations. You want to um, know exactly what your rights are and how to proceed in case of a storm. Um, if you have to make any adjustments to your policy, before the storm, it's when you can. If you try to make any adjustments after the storm, your insurance uh, carrier is not going to allow it. They're not going to allow you to expand your coverage after the storm. They're, that's capped. Once the even right before the storm, they're not going to allow you to make any adjustments to your policy. So make sure you know what you have in your policy, what the coverage are, what the limitations are. Because sometimes you can say, okay, we have a $2 million coverage. Yeah, but then you have to read the fine print. And the way to kind of go through those weeds is meet up with your insurance agent, sit down with, uh, with them, and have them explain to you in layman terms what are you covered and what you're not covered for. Very important. You have a, a debris removal professional. You know, cleaning around your building um, will make sure that your staff and those needing access to your building can reach it safely and secure in a secure manner. So make sure that you engage somebody. You don't have to, engaging somebody doesn't need that you have to pay them just to be on call. It's to sign a pre-storm um, agreement with them that in case of a storm, they have already given you their prices, they have already given you their fees, and you have already given them permission to come to your site and start working without any uh, further authorization or any other uh, red tape that you make them um, go through before they can start work. So that's really important. You want a building envelope professional, somebody that can ask, do the assessment of the damage to the exterior of the building. Remember, there is no point of having a water mitigation company come to your site if your roof is still open, if there's still water coming through your windows and your walls, because they're going to start removing um, carpets and uh, drywall and things like that. And then if it rains and the water keeps on coming in, they're going to have to do it again. So get the shell of the, uh, get the assessment of the shell first. So you know if you have to call your roofing uh, contractor or your waterproofing contractor to start working on putting you in the dry or to dry in your building. Um, the restoration professional, that's who I was referring to. Once your building is in the dry, once you have covered your roof or any damage to your roof, 
Then you bring a restoration professional that will take out all the garbage, all the drywall, all your appliances, whatever got damaged, and they'll start restoring your property in, in, a, in a professional way. Make sure you have a, uh, the relationship with a structural engineer, depending on the, uh, or somebody like Rudy, that they can uh, do the, uh, the assessment of the structure of the building. Uh, they have engineers and staff, structural engineers and, and staff, that they can say, and again, the greater the hurricane, the more likely your building can uh, obtain damage, uh, structural damage. So, so it is important. If you try to do that after the storm, I can assure you they will not even pick up the phone because they're going to be super busy running around because uh, they already have previous commitments. Um, uh, professional contractors. Who are these professional contractors? Plumbers, roofers, waterproofing contractors, mechanical contractor, your electrician, the people that you deal with every day uh, for the maintenance of the building, you have to make sure that they understand that if in, in case of a storm or in case of a hurricane, um, you need them to respond quickly, promptly uh, with the equipment that they need. And the way to do that is by signing a, an agreement with them prior to the storm. Again, it doesn't have to cost anything just to go into an agreement. What it does is gives you the peace of mind that first, they're not gonna come up, um, come around and give you some astronomical prices. <clears throat> Two, that you're gonna be on the list of people that they need to respond and that they're not gonna, they wanna get in and get out so they can go uh, help other people. So they want to know that they're not going to have to go through a lot of red tape in order to get to your building or to do what they need to do in your building. So those agreements take care of that. Okay. Uh, I just want to say that that was an excellent slide. Excellent slide for anybody that doesn't have any written plan at all. Uh, that one slide will get you just prepared. Great job, Ricardo. Thank you, Peggy. So again, we're gonna go through the roles and responsibilities of the different uh, lineup of your team. So with your insurance company, make sure that you verify the coverage, clarify your limits, explain the limitation, have them explain to you the limitations, um, present additional options. You know, if you don't ask, they're not gonna tell you, uh, well, how can we make this policy a lot more efficient for the association or for the business? Um, anticipate roadblocks. How how do we put in a claim? Uh, oh, you have to do it online. What if I can't do it online? Uh, is text uh, acceptable? Would WhatsApp would be acceptable? If we send you a picture of a claim instead of, you know, they say a fax, who has a fax machine anymore? So those things, but you'll find them in some contracts. So make sure that you go through all that with your insurance uh, agent. Um, the claim process, the timeline. Okay, if I put in a claim, how long will it take for us to get funded so we can start paying our, our other contractors? Um, verify the cost. And, um, and this is going to be a team effort with your vendors and your insurance company because the insurance company has, they tabulate their prices and how much they pay for each uh, discipline. So make sure that they are transparent on that so that you can be transparent with your vendors to say, hey, this is how much I can cover with the insurance. And they can tell you, hey, I cannot do it for that amount. Um, and then it's up to you to decide, okay, if it's more than this amount, we'll cover it ourselves or you know, we'll do financing, whatever it is, but it's a lot better to do it while you don't have the, the water up to your ankles and uh, trying to negotiate these things with, uh, with anybody. Your restoration professional, you know, verify the current conditions so that they know and they can make recommendation if in case they see something that needs to be strengthened or, or hardened in the building um, or in the interior or whatever it is, have them do an assessment of your conditions. They'll check your, your insurance coverage and they might be able to give you some recommendations. Um, set the after storm service fees. 
and the the respond time after the storm. That's very important that you get them to commit to a respond time. Otherwise, if you call them after the the incident happens, you go to the back of the line, um, sign the emergency response agreement, set the communication protocol. How do we get in contact with you? If it's not by via email, can we text you? Can we send you a, a what's up? Uh, how do we get in smoke signals? Whatever it is, make sure that you can get in, uh, get a hold of all those in your team. And after the storm, you're going to want them to do a condition assessment uh, to deploy the mitigation plan according to your needs and priorities, uh, coordinate with other disciplines. Um, for an example, the, the free remove the debris removal company. There's no point of calling all your other vendors if they cannot access your roof. So they have to coordinate with some of the vendors. There's no, if you don't tell your um, restoration professional they have no electricity, make sure that they bring um, generators and tell them, you know, they should know beforehand how big of a generation your building will need if in case your power is out and it's gonna be out for a week or so. Um, so that at least you can run AC units and refrigerators. I don't know. That's something that you need to talk to them about before the storm and not after. And um, communicate the safety concerns if, if needed. <coughs> With the building uh, envelope professional, same thing. Verify your current conditions. Uh, your building envelope professional will be able to tell you, again, your windows are in good shape, your walls are in good shape, or if you know what, you have to pay attention to your windows. The windows, the, the glazing of the window is, uh, is shrinking. There's gaps and cracks all, over, all around your windows. You need to make sure that all this is fixed before the next storm, or your roofs, um, your parking garages, whatever it is that's outside your building get an assessment of it, uh, verify your warranties. A lot of warranties, once it gets to a hurricane, they, they're they voided unless there's a wind underwrite, uh, which very few have. And it, it really, sometimes it really doesn't matter with the warranties. So be sure that you, you understand that if in case of a hurricane, that your roofing warranty uh, is not gonna be uh, an option. Um, but you also want to see who the contractor was that installed the roof. So you might want to engage them. Uh, you, you know, if your roof was recently replaced, you may want to have them as your, and they did a good job. You might want to have them as part of your team if uh, your roof gets damaged because they know they want to keep you as a client and they might give you a preference treatment. Um, you have to, Prior to the storm, set the fees with your, your billing envelope professional. How much would it cost to do the assessment? Are you going to do the assessment uh, on site, uh, on boots on the ground? Or are you going to be doing it with drones? However technique you're going to use, talk about that prior to the, um, to, to the storm. And again, set, sign the, the pre-storm agreement and also set the communication protocol. I'm gonna repeat that, and I know it's repetitive, but it's so important that you set the, the communication protocol. As I told you at the beginning, communication is the glue that makes all this work in, in uh, like an orchestra. And after the storm, get your building exterior assessed. Um, check the, what the priorities are for things that need to get fixed. Coordinate with the building exterior contractors, with your roofing contractor, with your waterproofing. Let your building exterior professional be your liaison between you and your exterior contractors. They can also help you with uh, your uh, owner's representative. Uh, coordinate and make to make sure that you get back in business as quick as possible. Um, and then, you know, they'll be able to provide you with the long-term repairs Sometimes it's just to get in the dry so you can start working on the interior. But in many cases, and I've seen this uh, through all the hurricanes uh, in the last 20 years, most of the times there's temporary um, dry-ins 
And then when the dust settles, we start talking about permanent repairs, permanent uh, replacements, et cetera, et cetera. Hey, Ricardo, what does SOW stand for? Um, Development for dry and SOW. Uh, uh, I'll remember. I can't remember right now. I saw it okay. now and I forgot. But I'll I'll tell you before the. Uh, but the function of that development for dry and that dry in is to dry the building with uh, a remediation company, correct? Well, to to dry the exterior of the building. So in many cases. You do it with a um, with a roofing company or a waterproofing company to put a, a temporary uh, ply, put a ply in or pour tarps on your roof so they can start working on the inside. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Um, with your structural engineer or your your uh, owner's rep. Have them verify the current conditions. See if there's any concerns that they need to know before a storm hits. Uh, and it's becoming more and more prevalent nowadays to have an instructional engineer look at your building. Uh, it's the the subject of that's a current subject to have your building inspected by a structural engineer. So make sure that that you do that. You engage a company like M2E to do this for you. Um, insurance companies are insurance companies are going to require it. Yeah. So, but if if you wait until the storm goes by and yeah. you try to engage a uh, a company to no. come do an inspection, good luck because it might take three, five, six months before they can get to your building. You've got to have you've got to have them locked down into a uh, a An emergency agreement. repair plan, yeah. emergency agreement. Correct. Yeah. So sign the emergency response agreement and set the communication protocol. See how you're gonna communicate with them uh, so they can respond to your uh, to your needs. And after the storm, they're gonna do the, the building structural assessment. Uh, they're gonna issue um, the safety concerns if needed, you know, and remediation to the structure of the building. You know, they'll guide you through that process. And, um, and also if there's any repairs that need to be some major structural repairs to the building, they'll walk you through that that process as, as well. So really important to, to have that. Um, and again, we don't know the type of hurricane that will come through this area. All we know is that there's gonna be some hurricanes coming through this area. It's, it's, not, it's not a matter of what, it's a matter of when, and we don't know how hard they're gonna, or how uh, strong they're gonna come through. So it is important because we don't know if it's going to be a category one and and fortunately it doesn't do a, a lot of damage, but it could be a category five. So don't prepare for a category one, prepare for a category five and get all your docs in a row. The debris removal professional, they're going to verify the current conditions. They're going to say, hey, you know what? If a storm comes and this tree falls, it's going to knock down this all these power lines. So you might want to trim it. I mean, they'll tell you what, the, the conditions are they do that every day. They um they, the, they're gonna develop a plan on how to get to your building the quickest. So the route, if you if trees are on this street, this is the first street that you're gonna clean up, then this one and then this one, and that'll get us to the building. So that's uh that's the plan. Don't need to for them to get there after the storm and start figuring out which street to clean first. Uh, which area to clean, what to remove. So they must have a plan before the storm. Um, set the after storm fees, same thing. You don't wanna, you don't wanna get uh, taken advantage of. Sign the agreement before the storm. Set your communication protocol with, um, with your debris removal professional. And after the storm, all they have to do is really come to the site and deploy the plan. They, they don't make them, uh, wait for a PO or wait for somebody's authorization. And we're going to talk about how to make sure that that happens um, and communicate any safety concerns if needed uh, that you know that, you know, might be hidden conditions or something like that that they need to know.
your professional contractors, again, your, your electrician, your mechanical contractor, your roofer, your waterproofing contractor, um, all those contracts you have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, engage them and get them on your lineup. Um, have them verify the current conditions. It really, most of them will do it for free. Some of them will have, will do that for a minimal or a, a, a yeah, a, an insignificant cost. Um, I'll see what that SOW, I can't remember now. Um, statement, a few people put statement of work. Yes, of course. Yes. That's the, your scope of work. There's not yes. the statement, the scope of work. Yes. Execute the scope of work to minimize the storm impact. I'm, thank you. Thank you yes, for that. There's some very smart, uh, we have some smart uh, <laughs> some people on, on staff. So, yes. <laughs> thank you for that. I, I went blank on that one. Um, set the after storm service fees and respond time. Very important. You know, hey, once the storm hit, they'll tell you, well, we'll be here in 48 hours. Um, in many cases, they need to make sure that they, their, their business is safe before they start going to help other people. And they have to make sure that their staff is safe before they can start sending them uh, other places. So, but at least you know that it's not gonna be like two hours after the storm. It's gonna be maybe a day or two after the storm. Whatever it is, make sure that you have those expectations clear. Sign the emergency response agreement and set your communication protocol. Uh, after the storm, double check after the storm assessment. I mean, your building envelope professional will do an assessment. They'll double check the assessment. Uh, your, your representative, your owner's rep will also have put their eyes on, on your building. You know, now they can start executing the emergency repairs to allow the restoration operation. That's what I was um, talking about earlier to get the building in the dry. And, you know, you might uh, put just a, a, a ply sheet or a cap sheet, nail down, seal on the, on the seams, just to make sure that water stops coming into the building while they start working on the inside. Um, and then you can work on the permanent, permanent repairs. Uh, coordinate with other disciplines. Your roofing and your waterproofing contractor might be working um, at the same uh, at the same time, or your roofing contractor and your restoration contractor. The roofing contractor uh, has to coordinate with them. Say, hey, this area of the building it's on the dry. You can start working on that. Uh, in the next three days, we're going to be working on the east side, whatever. But they coordinate among the the your different teammates to uh, make sure that you get back in business as quick as possible. Uh, if they communicate any concerns if needed, uh, if they say, hey, you know what, we cannot do this because we see that this part is still open and it's just gonna cost you more money if it rains tonight and everything gets flooded again, let's wait until they dry this out and then we'll, we'll proceed. Whatever it is, I mean, you have a relationship with them. And then they start generating the long-term proposals. You know, if you have to um, replace uh, drywall, carpets, anything in the interior of the building, ceiling, et cetera, then, then you'll have the time to work on that. For you and your staff, so be, this is very important because you are the quarterback of all the operation. So you have to make sure that you have a list of critical operations. So your elevators, for an example, you have to make sure that they work. And if they don't, what do we do? Who do we call? If um, if one contractor, that's very important. I'm just in the middle of a situation where the with the storm, water came in, knocked down one elevator out of two on a nine-story building. Um, there's a lot of seniors living in the building, and um, unfortunately, they had only engaged one roofer. So from now on, we're going to have uh, another roofer on, you know, on the bench just to make sure that there's the best second option in case the first roofer cannot get to 
the building in, uh, in a timely manner. So that's that's very important. Um, select the, your your professionals. It talks to what I just saying, and I, I I was just saying, there are some operations that might need a second layer of the fence. So if you have a, a, a mechanic, a, a elevator contractor, you might have two elevators contractor on roster. You know, you have a preferred one, but have one in case something happens. And it can be for any of the contractors that you have to deal with. Uh, make sure that you get those emergency response agreements signed. Make sure that you talk to your staff, have them help you get all those agreements signed and setting up the communication protocols with all the team. Um, communicate the plan internally so it, can e so it can be deployed flawlessly. What do I mean by that? Make sure that not only your, your immediate staff knows about it, make sure security knows about it. Make sure that um, sometimes even the local police knows about it so that they are not, if your debris uh, removal professional shows up, you know, make sure that they have a letter of authorization of access to the building that they can show the cops when they try to access your building. So all those things you have to think about prior to the storm. You're not going to be able to get all those things lined up after the, the hurricanes come through. After the storm, have your staff secure their home and family. You want them to feel safe. And one way to do that is by making sure that their loved ones are safe. So have them make sure that all their house, their loved ones are safe so they can really concentrate on getting the business or the building back on its feet. Uh, make sure they follow the communication protocol, communicate safety concerns if needed, you know, among them with the contractors, with your vendors, um, facilitate communication and coordination. Um, sometimes you get two vendors that are not used to working with each other. If they, hey, I don't know who to call from your um, restoration contractor, make sure that you can provide them with those numbers that they can coordinate. So those are this. that's the kind of support that you need to give your team so that the, the, the um, after the storm plan is deployed flawlessly. Um, and, you know, have them verify progress. They're not the ones doing the work, but they wanna make sure that things are happening in, in a way that is gonna get you back in business as soon as possible. So have them verify, help them, uh, uh, supervise, or if not supervise, but just make sure that whoever needs to be deployed gets deployed, whoever needs to be working on site, it's on site working. And if not, you know, communicate, have them communicate that so that it can be um, uh, salt resolved. So this is a checklist. And, you know, if, if anybody wants a copy of this presentation, I'm be more than glad to provide it. Always consider safety first. Again, it doesn't do you any good if you get hurt after the storm because you were trying to uh, move a branch and another branch fell on your head. So safety comes first. Don't step on any puddles. Don't go outside. Wait until storm has really cleared before you, you hit outside. Um, communicate any additional acts of requiring with your vendors. If they need to have a letter of authorization so that when they show up, they can show that to the cops um, so that they can get access to your building. Uh, you can believe the amount of people that try to respond after, I think it was uh, Wilma in, in, that hit this area and caused some damage, that cops wouldn't just let them in because they had no document, they had no PO, they had no uh, evidence of them being authorized to get to a certain building or a certain uh, place. Um, verify with your security department the access protocol for your vendors. Make sure that your security department knows that there's gonna be, gonna be people coming and give them the protocol. Hey, if somebody shows up with this letter, let them through. They don't have to come to us. They don't have to come to the office. They can just start working. That's the way that your your 
remediation plan or your um, after storm plan gets deployed. And for every plan and protocol, have a plan B. For every vendor, have a plan B. You know, don't just have one, have a plan B for, for every uh, plan and protocol. And after the storm, don't panic. Panic just makes things worse. You have a plan. If you have a plan, don't panic. Uh, if you don't have a plan, panicking is not going to help either, but there's nothing you're going to be able to do. But if you have a plan, don't panic. Just work your plan. That's why you work hard in, in putting it in place. So you and your staff are at the center of this. Again, you're the quarterback of the operation, of the, the after the storm operation. You're going to have your trusted professionals. You're going to have your preferred contractors. And if you line them up and you do the right things, um, it'll be a lot easier to, to bear the, uh, the impact of a storm. I don't know if there's any questions, Rudy. Nope, they're not. We um, kind of got it all done. So we, uh, we're good. No questions. If anybody has any questions, please put them in the Q&A in the bottom. Um, once again, a great, great uh, piece, Ricardo. Um, I hope it helps people. And uh, once again, just thank you for your time and, and thank you for your experience. We, uh, we really appreciate it. It's going to hopefully make every property a little bit more prepared. Thank you. And uh, thank you to the team, Layla, Peggy, and everybody uh, that's uh, on, the, on the call. Thank you for, for um, your support. Uh, I hope you find this uh, useful and and applicable. And if you have any questions, give us a call. If you need a if you need a copy or a sample of a of a pre storm agreement, something that's very simple, let us know. We'll be more than glad to provide you with one. Okay. You can you know you can change the vendor name and all that, and but it's a, it's a very clean cut to the chase type of document that that. Uh, you can have with your vendors and your your professionals. That's awesome. I'd like to have that. Uh, in fact, if you'll send it to me, uh, I'll send it out when I send out the sponsor sheet with all the sponsors uh, from today. Uh, I would just like to reiterate what uh, Rudy said. Awesome presentation. Uh, you can tell you gave it a lot of thought and that's how Ricardo does all of his work. So just put a plug in for that. Um, I also want to mention again, uh, the Ventium software package is excellent in times of uh, hurricanes or storms of any kind. Uh, if you haven't looked at it, you don't have a website, look at uh, Ventium's products. They have an excellent one for planning projects, managing projects, and that would certainly go along with the hurricane project as well. Uh, today, we've got our banks, we've got our uh, rapid response team, I'm sure they're helping out the Fort Lauderdale people in that area down there in Miami, why they're not here today. And Brown and Brown Insurance as well, I want to give another plug. If you need an insurance company, they are national, they are fabulous, and they know all about South Florida. So uh, with that, I just want to mention a couple of webinars that are coming up. On May 10th, I have a Spanish speaking board certification. If anyone uh, knows you need someone who only speaks Spanish, uh, this will be a great opportunity to hear it in Spanish. May 17th, we have an awesome presentation coming where the paving lady will put on the first hour of paving information. And the second hour is gonna be by M2E Engineering. I'm glad to have a Rudy that will be available and his team to discuss the new law changes that are coming up. So that'll be a complete hour with questions and so on uh, for laws that just changed about a week ago. May 31st, uh, we're going to also have emotional support animal uh, tentatively, a webinar on that. And I just will close by saying uh, as board members and managers, you are the leaders, lead your association and get prepared. Stay safe everyone with the hurricane season ahead and preparation may save your life and others. So hunker down. See you next time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you, everyone.